A magnificent view few of us will ever get to soak in. This is the helmet camera from NASA astronaut Tom Marshburn during a spacewalk today outside the International Space Station. Marshburn and his fellow astronaut Caleb Barron successfully removed a more than two decade old antenna that had stopped working. The spacewalk had been postponed due to a sudden debris risk. It's unclear whether it was related to the space debris created by a Russian anti-satellite test two weeks ago that forced crew members to scramble to safety. Tonight, more states confirming cases of the Omicron variant and a large gathering here in New York under the microscope. The question so many are asking tonight, will current vaccines be enough to fight it off? Health officials say it's still too soon to tell if Omicron, with roughly 50 mutations, is more transmissible. Martha Raddis takes us inside Moderna's manufacturing facilities. We have a rare glimpse into how the company is bracing for Omicron. What did you think when you first saw this, this variant? We looked at it and you know there was literally a list of eight or 10 mutations that we never wanted to see show up in one variant of concern. Tonight, the murder charge leveled against a former deputy in the deadly shooting of a black man killed while entering his grandmother's house last December. Our conversation with Casey Goodson's mom. Let's begin with what this indictment means to you and your family after a year of waiting. It means a lot. In Boston tonight, all these years later, the wound still fresh from the Boston Marathon bombing, that case reigniting a divisive debate issue in America. Should the death penalty exist? I'm curious, Liz, if the death penalty were to be thrown out in this case and he were to simply spend the rest of his life locked up in prison, how would you feel about that? Sad. Tonight, the domino effects of that shipping backlog, the emissions exacerbating problems for communities already dealing with poor air. Ginger Z has this week's It's Not Too Late. Some of these neighborhoods, people will wake up and they will actually have soot on their car. The ABC News exclusive, George Stephanopoulos' conversation with Alec Baldwin, his first sit-down interview since the deadly shooting on his movie set. Baldwin fighting back tears, describing the moment cinematographer Helena Hutchins was shot and killed by a gun he claims he never pulled the trigger on and had no reason to suspect had a live bullet in it. And good evening, everyone. I'm Phil Lipoff in for Lindsay Davis tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin at this hour with the all-out push here in the U.S. to track the Omicron variant and learn more about it, hoping to prevent a winter surge from getting even worse. This is the Delta variant continues to make its way through unvaccinated pockets of America. After a confirmed positive Omicron test from someone who attended a 53,000-person anime convention at the Javits Center in New York just before Thanksgiving, New York's governor revealing five cases in the state, but adding all are mild. And tonight, our Martha Raddatz with rare access inside Moderna's manufacturing facilities where the company is preparing for the possibility of a new booster shot. We should reiterate, though, for you, we do not know if that will even be necessary. How sick Omicron will make people? Is it more transmissible? And does it even reduce the effectiveness of immunity from vaccines? All questions need to be answered. The White House isn't taking any chances, laying out a new plan to try and prevent a winter surge. Wick Johnson leads us off tonight from New York. Tonight, at least four states now reporting cases of the new Omicron variant. New York, late today, reporting five new infections. Literally, there are five cases identified today in the state of New York. And in Colorado, a fully vaccinated woman who was eligible for a booster but hadn't received one. It is somebody who just traveled to southern Africa uh, and returned. Uh, she is uh, experiencing mild symptoms and is isolating at home. And in Minnesota, authorities calling a new case there a wake-up call, detecting the variant in a resident who had returned from New York City, where he attended an anime conference the weekend before Thanksgiving at the Javits Center. Officials suspect the man was likely infected at the conference seen here where the 53,000 attendees were required to have at least one vaccine shot and wear masks. Everyone was vaccinated, though, so I'm not too worried, but obviously variants are complicated. New York's governor, Kathy Hochul, is now urging those people to get tested. We do anticipate there'll be more cases, but to the extent that they are mild, we'll address them. This is not cause for alarm. The Minnesota man also reported mild symptoms, was fully vaccinated, and got a booster shot in early November. 
President Biden telling the American people we must be united as we fight this, laying out his winter strategy. He said there will be free at-home rapid tests with reimbursement for Americans with private insurance and 50 million free test kits to be handed out to the uninsured or those on Medicaid. The bottom line, this winter, you'll be able to test for free in the comfort of your home and have some peace of mind. The president also urged vaccinated Americans to get the booster, encouraging people to text their zip code to this number, 438829, immediately on your phone, and you'll get a list of the pharmacies in your area where there are boosters. We tested it today, and it worked. We move forward in the face of COVID-19 and the Delta variant, and we'll move forward in the face of Omicron variant as well. Experts warning we could soon be fighting COVID on two fronts, the unknown Omicron and the now surging Delta variant. Well, I think it's going to take a lot to displace um, the, the Delta variant. There's a good possibility that we'll have both variants uh, around for a while, particularly for the Omicron variant. In New York State, 37 hospitals with less than 10 percent capacity and facing staffing shortages will start postponing elective surgeries again. And in Michigan, there are more patients hospitalized now than at any other time in the pandemic. Our teams right now are caring for more patients than I have ever had on our ICU teams in the almost 20 years that I've uh, been a physician here. And with Johnson joins me now with the president today echoing what we've heard from Dr. Fauci and other experts that people who get a booster shot have the highest level of protection against COVID. We also know that several of these cases were in vaccinated people. Phil, that's right. We're still learning more about some of these new cases, but we know that at least four people were fully vaccinated and one had recently received a booster shot. Now, health experts have been predicting all along that even as new variants emerge, that the vaccines would provide some level of protection against severe illness. And in all of the cases in the U.S. that we know about, so far the symptoms have been mild. And with the Biden administration giving some clarity to ABC News about some new testing requirements for international travelers entering the United States, States that will take effect, what, next week? Yeah, Phil, this goes into effect next Monday. That means anybody traveling to the United States within 24 hours of travel will need to get a COVID test. It doesn't matter what their vaccination status is or where they're from or where they've traveled to. This will apply to anyone coming into the United States starting next week, Phil. All right, Wick Johnson, thank you. And as Omicron begins to spread today, Martha Raddatz received rare access inside Moderna in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where scientists are racing to update their vaccine to tackle the variant. So if a modified vaccine is needed, how soon could it be ready? Here's Martha. Tonight, ABC News getting an exclusive look at the Moderna research team preparing to take on Omicron. Here at the Moderna labs in Norwood, Massachusetts, they say production could begin on a new vaccine within the month. This facility produces 70% of Moderna's vaccine in the U.S., and they're ready to make another shot specifically designed to fight the new variant. Do you have the facilities to do both and do them rapidly? We do. We do have the capacity to do both and do them fast. It's still unclear whether that will be necessary, but Moderna's president, Dr. Stephen Hogue, is concerned. It is probably a, one of our worst case scenarios in terms of the combination of mutations that exist in one variant. What did you think when you first saw this, this variant? We looked at it and you know there was literally a list of eight or 10 mutations that we never wanted to see show up in one variant of concern. But Dr. Hogue today sounding more optimistic about his company's mRNA vaccine than Moderna's CEO Stefan Bonsell did just days ago, saying there was, quote, no world in which vaccine effectiveness doesn't drop against this new variant. I probably would have used different words. There is a scenario that the current vaccines wouldn't be by themselves sufficient to get the same high level of efficacy, but that doesn't mean that they wouldn't work at all. And Martha Raddatz joins us now from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Martha, as you just reported, Moderna says it can have an Omicron vaccine ready for production in a month or so if needed, but how long would it then actually take before shots could make it into arms? I think it would take about three months, but it would really be longer than that. That could roll into summer uh, because, of course, it would need FDA authorization. Pfizer also says they could have something in about 100 days. Mm. So in the meantime, what are those Moderna officials saying people should do? 
boosters, 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 and get the vaccines if you haven't already done so, because those vaccines do give you some level of protection. Phil? Sweet and to the point. Martha Raddatz, thanks so much. Now to a major development in the shooting death of Casey Goodson, a former sheriff's deputy in Columbus, Ohio, was just charged with murder. And this comes after that deputy and Goodman's family shared wildly different accounts of what they say happened that fateful day. Here's ABC's Alex Perez. Tonight, murder charges for former sheriff's deputy Jason Meade, who allegedly shot and killed a 23-year-old Casey Goodson Jr. in Columbus one year ago this week. This day could not come soon enough. Meade indicted on murder and reckless homicide charges. The former Franklin County, Ohio Sheriff's deputy told investigators he saw a good son who had a license to carry a concealed weapon, waving a firearm, and then pursued him. Meade says good son was entering the back door of a home with a weapon in hand and allegedly ignored commands to drop it. The family's confusion captured on 911. My grandson just got shot. Who shot him? I don't know. I okay. just heard the gunshots and I would get up and he's laying in the door. Goodson's family says he had no gun in hand and was returning from a dentist appointment with Subway sandwiches for the family. Photos show bullet holes on the screen door, his keys still in the lock, and a bag of food on the floor where he collapsed. Meade's attorney saying that Goodson was pointing the weapon at Meade and that the deputy acted within his lawful duties as an officer. An autopsy revealed Goodson was shot six times five of those bullets to the back. His heartbroken mother tonight says her fight for justice isn't over. The ultimate fight is the conviction, and I want a life sentence. That's what I'm fighting for. And Alex, what happens next in the criminal case against Meade? Yeah, Phil, so that criminal case now moving forward. Meade is expected to make his first appearance in court. His attorney says he intends to plead not guilty. Uh, he was on administrative leave and retired from the department in July. Phil? Alex Perez, thank you. And now we're joined by Casey Goodson's mother, Tamela Payne, and her family's attorney, Sean Walton. Thank you both so much for taking the time. Uh, Tamela, I'm the father of two children. I can't wrap my head around the loss of a child, and I'm, I'm sorry that you've had to. Thank you. Let's begin with what this indictment means to you and your family after a year of waiting. It means a lot. You know, um, it's the first part, you know, of the fight, so it means a lot to us. It, 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 we feel like we have a piece of the accountability that we're looking for. Sean, there is no video that we know of of Casey's shooting, but even so, people came out in large numbers to protest after he died. Do you think that attention helped lead to today's murder charges? You know, I think what happened was that uh, the family flipped the narrative. Initially, they tried to say that Casey pointed a gun, but what we found was that Casey was entering his home. He had Subway that day. He was leaving the dentist. He was an innocent young man that was murdered. And I think the facts and the evidence here point to that. And it's been uh, clear and uh, very evident to the public, based on the story that's been told, that Casey is a victim. And, and I think that is what moved it. I think the protests were a byproduct of, of the family really advocating to tell Casey's truth. It, does it, is it remarkable to you in any way that you have these charges now and there was no body camera, there was no bystander video as we, you know, we saw in like, you say the George Floyd case or something like that, that is so integral to getting those charges. In this case, you know, how many stories have there been where there haven't been any video, where there hasn't been any video? Is, is it remarkable to you? You know, it truly is. And there are no witnesses either. And so that tells you how egregious the actions of Jason Meade were that there's no eyewitnesses, there's no video, yet it's clear that Casey was a victim and this was a murder. Uh, Jason Meade is a, a, a former deputy who bragged about his use of force, his righteous release that he received when, when doing so. And he's a, a, a sheriff's deputy that was on the no contact with inmates list for almost four years and somehow ended up on the SWAT team. So, uh, you know, it's clear here who the aggressor was. Uh, and, you know, Jason Mee bragged about his right to throw the first punch. And that's what happened here. He shot Casey in his back. Tamla, your family has filed a lawsuit, and one claim you make is that Meade had hundreds of hours of firearms and SWAT training, but little to no training in violence de-escalation. How might that kind of de-escalation training you think saved your, may, have, may have saved your son? 
Um, if I'm being honest with you, I'm not really sure if any type of training that murder me had would have saved my son because of his history, uh, uh, the hate that's that's filled inside of murder me. Murder me preaches about um, hunting people and. Um, throwing the first punch and the people that he hit, you wish you could hit too. So I think that murderer Me's actions, although he did use a, aggressive force and things of that nature, I think is a lot of his actions came from the hatred that he huh. carries in his heart. Yeah, I can certainly understand that response. Sean, let me ask you the same question. Legally, as this moves forward, uh, do you think something like that could help in the future? You know, absolutely, uh, from the standpoint that uh, Jason Meade's uh, training focused on firearms qualifications. They essentially uh, trained him to be um, a violent uh, individual. You know, he was placed on this task force, and uh, because of that lack of de-escalation training, it was clear what he prioritized as an officer and what Franklin County prioritized in their officers. And so that's how we got here. Uh, but like Tamala said, um, what happened that day is unjustifiable, uh, shooting a young man walking into his home. And so when it comes to Meade, um, you know, it, it, the uh, jury is out in terms of what could have prevented this. And Tamala, finally, I see you're, you're wearing a, a picture of your son on your sweatshirt. Um, and, and in the beginning, I, I, I mentioned it's hard for any parent to wrap their head around losing a child. Uh, we've talked a lot about you know, the charges, the case, de-escalation, you know, whatever. I just want, before we go, for you to tell us something about your son, all this back and forth between, you know, lawyers and sides and protesters and whatever. Um, I'd, I'd like to know what you want us to know about your son, the, the human at the center of this. That he was a great individual. He, he did nothing. He had a big heart. He was kind. He was gentle. He was an old soul. And... Um, he was just a good son, as his last name states, and he didn't deserve what happened to him. But he's also a legend, and he's special, and he, he will remain special for as long as the world lives in my eyes, because he's going to make a change. Yeah, and in your heart forever. Uh, Tim LePayne, Sean Walton, thank you both so much for taking the time with us tonight. Thank you. And when we come back, the daring cliff rescue, the hiker spotted clinging to that hillside, and the ABC News exclusive Alec Baldwin breaking his silence about the fatal shooting on his movie set. But up next, the ultimate punishment, a city grappling with what should be done to the young man who brought terror to their community. Our in-depth look at the death penalty, next. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. We have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family himself in jeopardy for us. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. This 
is what being live is Please all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Welcome back, everyone. Take a look at that close call. A pickup truck missing an Idaho State trooper by just inches. Police cruiser captured the moments as the trooper was helping a stranded motorist. The officer received some minor injuries, but is said to be doing fine. And that close call was the beginning, though, of a six-car pileup. And next, how do we as a society grapple with the men and women who commit unimaginable horror? The United States is one of 53 nations that has capital punishment. There has been a debate for years, as you know, about if it's even effective. But in Boston, the issue has become deeply personal as it works its way through the Supreme Court. Trevor All brings us this in-depth look. No matter how many years pass, the Boston Marathon continues. Some wrongs can never be made right. The city of Boston will forever carry the often invisible scar tissue of that horrific day. Three people died in those blasts, more than 260 injured. Survivors like Lynn, Julie, and Krisky have spent years coming to terms with a suffering that's both communal and intensely personal. The question she still grapples with, even today, should one more person lose their life? It's been several years now, and this is still under discussion in the Supreme Court. Don't get me started about that. We had two years before his court date, two years of limbo, and the trial went on for months and months. And when we finally got what we thought was gonna be closure, he was given the death sentence. What sets the death penalty apart from any other sentence is its finality, which means the appeals process is extensive, in some cases taking 40 years. Convicted marathon bomber Jokar Zarnayev was sentenced to death in federal court back in 2015. But that decision is still under dispute. Thrown out in 2020 by a lower U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, now under consideration from the Supreme Court, and reigniting the existential discussion over the death penalty and the justice system at large. Is its purpose crime deterrence and rehabilitation? Is it retribution? Is it vengeance? The answer depends on who you ask. I can remember you know, learn and that I'm sorry, because it's still emotional, you know, I, I, for me, it never goes away. Liz Norden had two of her sons injured in the marathon bombings, both of them losing legs. And she now suffers from severe anxiety. You are, as you've said, forever changed. Do you want restitution for that? Well, I watch my sons put a leg on every day and you know, the simple things for us might be challenges for them. Again, I can only stress they're really doing well. But my son JP said to me one day, there's not a day that goes by that he doesn't walk without pain on his prosthetic. So I'm not looking for restitution. I want I want the I want the ultimate justice. And justice for me would be the death penalty. In Massachusetts, Liz is in the minority. Only twenty percent of residents want Zarnayev put to death. But nationally, she's in the majority, with about 60% in favor of executing people convicted of murder. Liz tells us she hopes Zarnayev's death would deter others from committing crimes, though there's no proof the death penalty is any more of a deterrent than a life sentence. If the death penalty were to be thrown out in this case, and he were to simply spend the rest of his life locked up in prison, how would you feel about that? 
sad. Would you feel like justice had not been served? I would. The United States is one of 53 countries where capital punishment is legal. While there's currently a moratorium on federal executions, right now there are about 2,500 inmates on death row in the 27 states where it's allowed. The capital punishment remains largely controversial. 23 states have done away with it altogether, finding issue in its many imperfections. Like Zarnayev, there are many inmates on death row who without a doubt have committed heinous crimes. But far too often, the system gets it wrong. Like the case of George Stinney Jr., a 14-year-old wrongfully convicted and executed for the murder of two young white girls. In fact, since the death penalty was reinstated in 1976, 185 people sentenced to death have been exonerated. That means there has been one exoneration for every 8.3 people who've been executed. Robert Dunham is the executive director of the Death Penalty Information Center. He spent his professional life as a capital litigator, even arguing before the Supreme Court. If you're going to have a death penalty, you're going to have communities re-victimized. We all know Boston Strong, and there are significant questions about should we subject the entire Boston community to a new trial? America has long struggled with how to humanely put prisoners to death. Depending on where you live, if you're on death row, there are five different ways the state may kill you. Gas chamber, hanging, electrocution. Some states have recently reinstituted firing squads and the most common, lethal injection. In 1982, the first lethal injection was administered to Charles Brooks Jr. in Huntsville, Texas, a state now responsible for more than a third of the country's 1,300 lethal injection sets. The town is checkered with reminders it was built around the prison system. And it was there in 1998 that journalist Michelle Lyons witnessed her first execution. I felt like I... Um... I could do it and be okay. She soon became the spokesperson for the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, ultimately witnessing nearly 300 prisoners die. It was my job to bring the reporters to death row for these media days that we would have. So now I'm seeing these inmates week after week. That makes it more complex to then watch these people die. And in 2005, Michelle says her pregnancy made it far more difficult to do her job. You're seeing a woman going in that room and watching her child die in front of her. And one of the inmates was saying how he had told his mother he didn't want her to come. And that she had said, you know, I was here when you came in this world and I will be there when you leave it, you know, and that, that, that tears you up to hear. But, you know, at the same time, they're there for a reason. As disturbing as it may be, witnesses are a legal requirement of the execution process, ensuring they take place in public view. While some states now use a single drug, a traditional lethal injection involves a three-drug cocktail, an anesthetic followed by a paralytic agent, and then a killing drug. If it all works correctly, the paralytic will cause the eyelids to close, the neurons in the brain stop firing, and the cardiovascular system shuts down. All of this should happen within 5 to 15 minutes. But if it goes wrong, and sometimes it does, it could take several agonizing hours. Uh, in about 80% of the autopsies, uh, we see evidence of flash pulmonary edema, that is, a buildup of fluid in the lungs. Uh, and it's been likened by the courts uh, to a process in which the person uh, is conscious during waterboarding, suffocation, and three drug executions. Uh, they then experience chemical fire from the killing drug. Michelle Lyons no longer works for the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, but the memories have haunted her. There's so many victims. You know, you, you have the, the actual victims, but then you also have the, the inmate and their family. You have chaplains who have to witness each of these. You have officers who have to escort these people in the room and tie them down. I mean, you have all these people that have to live with, with those decisions. There are countless families of murder victims who understandably want to see the culprit experience the same fate as their loved ones. But a study done by the University of Minnesota found just 2.5% of victims' family members reported achieving closure as a result of capital punishment. For survivors like Lynn, that process is an everyday struggle. 
because there is a difference between healing and being made whole. Do you think you will have closure? Is it even possible at this point? I am hoping that closure still exists for us, but what happened to us is so internalized emotionally and spiritually that we could never be the same people again. Do you believe Joe Karzarnayev deserves to live? Wow. <laughs> that is a loaded question. I don't know that I have the power, the right, the authority to say one way or the other whether anyone has a right to live, and neither did he. He had no right to do what he did. He had no power or authority to decide who lives or dies. But neither do I. It's a powerful story. Our thanks to Trevor. Still ahead here on Prime, the accidental shooting police say that led to the arrest of the suspect wanted for the deadly shooting of a music executive's wife in Beverly Hills. The domino effects of the supply chain crisis on the environment. Ginger Z brings us this week's It's Not Too Late. And what do you think is the most expensive city to live in? We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day from actor Michael McKeon remembering fellow actor Eddie Mecca, best known for his role as Carmine on the hit sitcom Laverne and Shirley. He was 69 years old. Extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. The breaking news overnight. Emergency crews called to the town of Surfside. U.S. airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria. The stories people are talking about. If you don't want to shave your legs, don't. I was going to say. Oh, my. Got it. And what to expect in the day ahead. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. See why Sunday mornings, more and more Americans are now turning first to ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Welcome to This Week. being live is Please all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not them. afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. 
Welcome back, everyone. Here's a question for you. What's the most expensive city in the world to live in? The answer a new study came up with will probably surprise many of you. Here's a look by the numbers. Number one for highest cost of living is Tel Aviv, Israel. That's according to a biannual report by the Economist Intelligence Unit, which looks at the prices of hundreds of products and services in cities around the globe. It's the first time Tel Aviv hit the top spot, a climb from fifth place just a year ago. Researchers say it's mainly because their currency, the shekel, greatly appreciated relative to other currencies driving up prices. Second most expensive city, Paris. Singapore in third place. New York came in sixth place worldwide. Surprise to a lot of folks who live here, but it's still the most expensive city in America. Rome had the largest drop in cost of living ranking, falling 16 places to 48th. Tehran had the biggest increase in cost of living ranking, jumping 50 places to 29th. Researchers say it's because of shortages and rising import prices because of U.S. sanctions. Overall, the cost of goods and services, they track surge 3.5% in just a year, but no surprise here, the biggest surge was in worldwide gas prices, a 21% spike from just last year. And we still have a ton to get to here on Prime. Meghan Markle's big win in court will explain, and the surprise medical procedure that forced Carlos Santana to cancel his Vegas shows for the rest of the year. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. Extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime. 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my, mom. my wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. Five, this is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people news. squeezing into this bomb shelter. Run, urgent delivery, run with Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Okay. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Five additional cases of the COVID variant Omicron found in New York State, in addition to cases found in California, Colorado, and a man from Minnesota. 
The state's Department of Health saying the patient is from Hennepin County and is fully vaccinated. He developed mild symptoms on November 22nd, got a test two days later, and has since recovered. But they also say the patient recently traveled to New York City for an anime convention just days before his symptoms started. We knew it would come to New York State at some point. The White House is rolling out a list of actions to combat the new variant, including making at-home rapid tests free, extending the mask requirement on public transit through mid-March, and requiring more stringent testing protocols for all international travelers. And now, amid growing concerns about the Omicron variant, a number of colleges and universities say they will require booster shots for students next semester. The suspected burglar who shot himself in the foot under arrest in the unrelated murder of Jacqueline Avant, the wife of music executive Clarence Avant. The murder took place during a home invasion in Los Angeles early yesterday morning. Police say a short time later, 29-year-old Ariel Menor broke into a different home and wound up shooting himself. He was subsequently arrested by LAPD and transported to a local hospital and has been in law enforcement custody since. Detectives say they were able to link Maynor to Avant's murder through surveillance video. They don't have a motive for Jacqueline Avant's murder at this point. Clarence Avant was recently inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and is often referred to as the black godfather of the music industry. China's new missile system that's under development has the U.S. concerned. While on a trip to South Korea, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin touched upon Beijing's research into hypersonic weapons. We have concerns about the military capabilities that the PRC continues to pursue. And the pursuit of those capabilities increases, increases tensions in region. It just underscores why we consider the PRC to be our pacing challenge. Experts say the hypersonic weapons system is designed to evade U.S. missile defenses, although China insists it's been testing a reusable space vehicle, not a missile. A win in British court for Meghan Markle in her privacy lawsuit against a newspaper that published parts of a letter that she wrote. She may not be seen as the people's princess over here, but she's won again, this time in the court of appeal. Despite the fact that this case shows she was economical with the truth in the first, the second judgment also goes her way over the publication parts of a letter she wrote to her father three years ago. Having said that, it still may not be over. Associated newspapers could still pursue the matter at the UK Supreme Court or the European Court of Human Rights. The Duchess of Sussex says her victory is not just for her, but quote, for anyone who has ever felt scared to stand up for what is right. Newly released images of a daring cliff rescue near Ragged Point, California. The hiker was spotted clinging precariously to a small ledge on the hillside, hundreds of feet above the ground. The man appeared exhausted but stable as he held on about 100 feet below the highway. A helicopter rescue team lowering a net where a rescuer helped him up to safety. Good job, halfway. Landing safely on the lawn of the Ragged Point Inn. Legendary guitarist Carlos Santana is taking a break after going through an unspecified heart procedure. The 74-year-old posted a video online saying his wife took him to the hospital this past weekend because he wasn't feeling well. So I'm going to be taking time out for a little bit to make sure I replenish and I rest and uh, catch up with my health so that when I play for you, I would play the way I'm used to and give you 150%. Santana was supposed to play seven concerts this month in Las Vegas, including a show last night and one tomorrow. All of those shows have been canceled for now as he recovers. Now to an ABC News exclusive, George Stephanopoulos one-on-one -on -one with actor Alec Baldwin. Baldwin breaking his silence on that fatal shooting on his movie set, claiming he didn't pull the trigger. A lawyer for the director of photography says he's always said the same, that Baldwin didn't shoot. Some are pushing back tonight. Here's ABC's Kaylee Hartung. Tonight, a witness to the shooting on the Russ movie set corroborating Alec Baldwin's claim that he did not pull the trigger of the gun that killed Helena Hutchins. Well, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. So no. you never pulled the trigger? No, 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 no. I, I would never point a gun at anyone and pull a trigger at them, never. Assistant Director Dave Hall's attorney telling me he was just a few feet from Baldwin when the gun went off. Until Alec said that, it was just really hard to believe, but Dave has told me since the very first day I met him that Alec did not pull that trigger. Baldwin recalling that tragic day in October during an exclusive interview with George Stephanopoulos. You said you're not a victim, but 
Is this the worst thing that's ever happened to you? Yes. Yeah. 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 Because I, I, I think back and I think of what could I have done? Baldwin also saying he had no reason to suspect the gun contained a live round. But tonight, new questions. How could a gun just go off? Veteran armor and prop master Dutch Merrick saying accidental discharges for the Colt 45 revolver used are rare but possible. If it's not functioning properly, perhaps the internal mechanism can be jarred to drop the hammer. Um, it's a pretty rare circumstance. That gun is designed not to fire without the trigger being pulled. And as the investigation tries to determine how live rounds wound up on the movie set, authorities searching this prop arsenal. According to the search warrant, PDQ Arm and Prop was one of the vendors supplying Rust with blanks and dummy rounds. Owner Seth Kenny did not want his face on camera. It's not a possibility that they came from PDQ or from myself personally. There's something very unique about the live rounds that were found on Rust, but we've got to wait for the FBI to do its job. Kaylee Hartung joins us now. Kaylee, you spoke to both the sheriff and the DA in Santa Fe today. What did they tell you? Yeah, they had very similar reactions, Phil, to this news that Alec Baldwin is claiming he didn't pull the trigger. They both said it has been established that Baldwin was holding the gun when it discharged, killing Helena Hutchins. And they say we have to wait for the FBI to examine that gun and analyze the ammunition on set. Phil. All right, Kaylee Hartung staying on top of this for us. Thank you. And you can catch Alec Baldwin unscripted tonight on ABC. Check your local listings. It will also be on Hulu and air tomorrow night after Prime here on ABC News Live. Now to the efforts to avoid a government shutdown looming over Washington as federal funding is set to run out at midnight tomorrow. The House today passed a short-term measure to extend that funding until mid-February at current funding levels. But after a threat from some Senate Republicans led by Senator Mike Lee to hold up approval over opposition to federal funds being used for President Biden's vaccine mandate, Senate leaders are working to strike a deal to move approval of the short-term funding measure forward tonight. The United States has rolled out changes to its Remain in Mexico policy pending an agreement from the Mexican government. The policy first instituted under the Trump administration has been the subject of intense scrutiny. It forced most asylum seekers uh, along the border to wait in Mexico while their claims were being processed. The Biden administration tried to end the policy, what was blocked by the courts. Now, the administration plans to expand what they consider vulnerable individuals who will be exempt from the policy and to expedite asylum cases in under 180 days. Finally tonight, the shipping backlog is adding fuel to an existing problem in the Los Angeles area, poor air quality. But as Ginger Z reports in this week's It's Not Too Late, local organizations are stepping up to help. I'm Ginger Z, and it's not too late. Okay, so welcome to the port of Long Beach, where you can at least see it. And yes, all of those ships, part of that backlog disaster that you've been hearing so much about. The major backlog of container ships at the ports of LA and Long Beach. The traffic jam on the high seas could be delaying your packages. Shipments are stuck at ports in California. For you or me, this is a backlog of goods, maybe a delayed couch or something as important as a wheelchair. But at the same time, for the folks who live around this port, it means sickening haze. Yes, you can smell this. You feel it. Farrell Golden and John Cross have lived in West Long Beach, the neighborhood that borders the port, for most of their lives. West Long Beach area has been known since the mid-2005, 6, 7, as a diesel death zone. The diesel death zone, or asthma alley, as it's sometimes called, surrounded by impure air. We got a 710 freeway which handles thousands and thousands of trucks to the east of us. To the north of us, we got the 405 freeway which has trucks on it. To the west, we got rail yards, freeways, and refineries. And to the south, we got the port. We can't take any more pollution. They can't take any more. Yet in the last year, more ships means more trucks, more trains, and more pollution. In the last year, with the surge of more container ships, have you noticed a difference? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You could turn around and get in your car, <laughs> and after a couple of days, it's covered with black soot. 
John wasn't exaggerating. We drove into the neighborhood and did our own unscientific test on a car. Some of these neighborhoods, people will wake up and they will actually have soot on their car. In neighborhoods like this, the Long Beach Alliance for Children with Asthma report that they have a higher asthma rate among residents than anywhere else in California. There is a direct correlation between air pollution and asthma. Yes, there is. But that large body of evidence shows that diesel pollution and children's lungs don't mix. Children in particular, because their lungs are still developing, even before this particular image, there was already an overwhelming amount of diesel pollution in our community. The Port of Los Angeles is the busiest port in all the United States, with the Port of Long Beach not far behind. Roughly 40% of America's cargo comes through these ports. The average number of container ships at the ports of Long Beach and LA, 16. Right now, more than 110. You can see so many of them stacked up. They wait for weeks at a time sometimes, and you can see the heavy line of smog and haze sitting right over where people live. People are having to breathe in this stuff so that, people, so that other people in, across the country can get cheap TVs. That's not fair. Hector De La Torre is a member of the California Air Resources Board, or CARB. It's a state agency that regulates air quality. A study that they did back in March shows the increase in port traffic was equivalent to the nitrogen oxide emissions of nearly six million cars. And that was before the latest surge. Is it one to one where more container ship means more emissions, more haze, more smog? It, it, it does in a lot of ways meaning it isn't just the ships, right? Once they get here, then all of these containers end up on a truck or on a train that pollute the communities as well. So there is a whole uh, movement of pollution, not just offshore, but it comes onshore and then through our communities. But you can't control how a ship filters or doesn't filter. No, because there is no international body that regulates them. We can control them when they're right here. California's air quality rules are about as tight as they come. The Air Resources Board makes ships that are near the California shore plug in to local power so that they can turn off the diesel engines, reducing emissions. 70% of the toxic effect of air pollution comes from diesel. We have to reduce that. What we want to do going forward is to change how we do goods movement to make it zero emission. The ships, when they're here, the trucks, when they're on the road, be zero emission meaning either battery electric or hydrogen fuel cell. Not only will zero emission ships and vehicles be good for the health of the port neighbors, but it's benefiting all of us. Think about it. Less idling trucks and ships means less carbon dioxide warming the planet. And this isn't science fiction. In November, the first fully autonomous electric cargo ship was unveiled in Norway. The ship has as many batteries as 100 Tesla cars and prevents as much as 678 tons of carbon dioxide a year from entering the atmosphere. Vessels like this are sorely needed. The global shipping industry emitted more than 1 billion tons of carbon dioxide in 2018. Unfortunately, the electric ship in Norway is only good for short trips. It isn't ready to make long haul crossings. Until then, California ports can begin to tackle the problem by making other vehicles zero emission. We're on it. We Just this last budget, uh, the California legislature approved $2.3 billion for zero emission heavy duty vehicles in California. Wow. $2.3 billion, that's bigger than some states' budgets. Yes. And we are putting that into this because we want to drive the market to right. switch over. For now, the ports are asking ships to idle farther offshore to help reduce air pollution right along the coastline. They're gonna push them to 150 miles away and then call them and have them come in. The people here say that probably won't be enough. It's gonna end up being about congestion, about volume. That will have to change, and then it won't be too late. Ginger, thank you for that. And we here at ABC News are counting down to our colleague Michael Strahan's liftoff to space next week. And with space on our mind, of course, our Gio Benitez took a look at the extraordinary inventions here on Earth born from space exploration. Ignition, liftoff. Scientific discovery has fueled our fascination with outer space from the beginnings of the space race as seen in Hollywood films like Hidden Figures. The goal point for re-entry is 2,990 miles from where we want Colonel Glenn to land. To finding new methods to sustain life on Mars, so, like in The Martian. I gotta figure out a way to grow 
three years worth of food here on a planet where nothing grows. Luckily, I'm a botanist. And while it may seem like science fiction, the innovations developed in the pursuit of space exploration are very real, from the cameras in our phones to the memory foam in our mattresses. We invent a lot of really, really interesting things as a res result of exploration. And those inventions and those technologies actually are so useful right back down here on Earth. Former NASA astronaut Dr. Katie Coleman has been on three missions to space, spending almost six months on the International the Space Station, participating in research studying the effects of weightlessness on plant growth, water behavior, and her own body's response to the lack of gravity. We actually lose bone and muscle 10 times faster than a woman who is 70 years old who has osteoporosis. And because it happens to us so quickly up there, that knowledge comes right back down here to Earth when we also understand how could we prevent and help people with osteoporosis right here. Space tech has made a huge impact on medical advancements around the world, from implantable heart monitors to water purification systems. Laser eye surgery was made possible because of NASA hardware that tracks involuntary eye movements. Even robotics created to make repairs to the space station are now used to help surgeons perform less invasive procedures. And maybe Michael will discover something up there as well. Can't wait to see. Gio, thank you for that. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. Take a look at this. Just a villager looking at Indonesia's most active volcano. Nothing to see here. What an amazing picture. That's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, more than a dozen Michigan school districts canceling classes after receiving threatening messages online. This, of course, after a deadly school shooting in that state this week. It's an annual holiday problem, porch pirates. We're going to take a look at the creative ways police are now trying to catch thieves. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people squeezing, squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The ladies you love. The hottest topics happening now. There's only one place to find it all. You guys are having the hard conversations. I love The View. The most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it. Serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. We have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. News.
Honored, winner of nine Edward R. Murrow Awards, more than any other network, including winning for the third straight year the award for overall excellence in television. ABC News is America's number one news source. With so much at stake, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one newscast and the number one program on television. Hi, everyone. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken calling his 30-minute conversation with his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, in Sweden serious and sober. He says the U.S. is prepared to act should Russia continue to intimidate Ukraine. Recent satellite images show Russian troops amassing along Ukraine's borders. President Biden expected to call Vladimir Putin in the coming days amid this tension. A wildfire pushed by strong winds has ripped through a small Montana farming town, destroying two dozen homes and some other buildings. No one was hurt, which is the good news in that fire, but 300 residents were evacuated early Wednesday when a downed power line sparked a fire and left the city without water. And finally, LeBron James has been cleared of the NBA's health and safety protocols after additional testing for COVID-19 came back negative. According to ESPN, he is expected to play in a game against the Los Angeles Clippers tomorrow night after returning eight negative COVID tests since his initial positive test on Saturday. Now to the pandemic and the new cases of the Omicron variant now reported in New York, Minnesota, Colorado. Dr. Fauci has said the vaccines and the boosters will help fight this. And so far, we are only hearing of mild symptoms. Tonight, President Biden announced new steps to battle the virus as we head into the winter months. Here's ABC's Whit Johnson. Tonight, at least four states now reporting cases of the new Omicron variant. New York, late today, reporting five new infections. Literally, there are five cases identified today in the state of New York. And in Colorado, a fully vaccinated woman who was eligible for a booster but hadn't received one. It is somebody who just traveled to southern Africa uh, and returned. Uh, she is uh, experiencing mild symptoms and is isolating at home. And in Minnesota, authorities calling a new case there a wake-up call, detecting the variant in a resident who had returned from New York City, where he attended an anime conference the weekend before Thanksgiving at the Javits Center. Officials suspect the man was likely infected at the conference seen here, where the 53,000 attendees were required to have at least one vaccine shot and wear masks. Everyone was vaccinated, though, so I'm not too worried, but obviously variants are complicated. New York's governor, Kathy Hochul, is now urging those people to get tested. We do anticipate there'll be more cases, but to the extent that they are mild, we'll address them. This is not cause for alarm. The Minnesota man also reported mild symptoms, was fully vaccinated, and got a booster shot in early November. President Biden telling the American people we must be united as we fight this. Laying out his winter strategy, he said there will be free at-home rapid tests with reimbursement for Americans with private insurance and 50 million free test kits to be handed out to the uninsured or those on Medicaid. The bottom line, this winter, you'll be able to test for free in the comfort of your home and have some peace of mind. The president also urged vaccinated Americans to get the booster, encouraging people to text their zip code to this number, 438829, immediately on your phone, and you'll get a list of the pharmacies in your area where there are boosters. We tested it today, and it worked. We move forward in the face of COVID-19 and the Delta variant, and we'll move forward in the face of Omicron variant as well. Experts warning we could soon be fighting COVID on two fronts, the unknown Omicron and the now surging Delta variant. Oh, I think it's going to take a lot to displace um, the, the Delta variant. There's a good possibility that we'll have both variants uh, around for a while, particularly for the Omicron variant. In New York State, 37 hospitals with less than 10 percent capacity and facing staffing shortages will start postponing elective surgeries again. And in Michigan, there are more patients hospitalized now than at any other time in the pandemic. Our teams right now are caring for more patients than I have ever had on our ICU teams in the almost 20 years that I've uh, been a physician here. Whit Johnson, thank you. And as Omicron spreads, today ABC's Martha Raddatz received some rare access inside Moderna in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where scientists are racing to update their vaccine to tackle the variant. So if a modified vaccine is needed, 
How soon could it be ready? Here's Martha. Tonight, ABC News getting an exclusive look at the Moderna research team preparing to take on Omicron. Here at the Moderna labs in Norwood, Massachusetts, they say production could begin on a new vaccine within the month. This facility produces 70% of Moderna's vaccine in the U.S., and they're ready to make another shot specifically designed to fight the new variant. Do you have the facilities to do both and do them rapidly? We do. We do have the capacity to do both and do them fast. It's still unclear whether that will be necessary, but Moderna's president, Dr. Stephen Hogue, is concerned. It is probably a, one of our worst case scenarios in terms of the combination of mutations that exist in one variant. What did you think when you first saw this, this variant? We looked at it and you know there was literally a list of eight or 10 mutations that we never wanted to see show up in one variant of concern. But Dr. Hogue today sounding more optimistic about his company's mRNA vaccine than Moderna's CEO Stefan Bonsell did just days ago, saying there was, quote, no world in which vaccine effectiveness doesn't drop against this new variant. I probably would have used different words. There is a scenario that the current vaccines wouldn't be by themselves sufficient to get the same high level of efficacy. But that doesn't mean that they wouldn't work at all. Martha Raditz from Massachusetts tonight. Today, we got to see the faces behind the names of the victims in that tragic high school shooting in Michigan. This as prosecutors continue to focus on his parents. ABC's Trevor Alt has the latest for us. Tonight, as the Oxford High School community mourns, the Oakland County, Michigan prosecutor now revealing new details to us about how the suspect allegedly accessed the weapon his father bought on Black Friday and used it to gun down fellow students. I think the evidence you'll see in, in the near future suggests that it wasn't that he, he didn't have to work that hard to get it. There are cases of, throughout the state and the country where uh, a weapon's been left out and a child gets a hold of it and uses it and uses it to injure or kill somebody. And those individuals have been charged with very serious crimes. The suspect's parents met with school officials the day of the shooting after two separate teachers reported concerns about his behavior, but he was allowed to return to class. In the wake of the shooting, schools in Michigan now hyper vigilant, more than 60 canceling classes today. At one school in nearby Southfield, a 17 year old who allegedly had a loaded gun in his coat pocket turned in Wednesday by another student. That's a message of exactly what we're asking for. If another student turned him in. An overnight of vigil remembering the four victims killed. Tate Meir, Hannah St. Juliana, Madison Baldwin, and Justin Schilling. They played this video of Mir speaking after a football game. This is where we live. Rain is just like after football. Tough, muddy, everything about us is tough. Tonight, there's a movement to name Oxford's football stadium after him. And Trevor all joins me now. Trevor, has the prosecutor here given any indication on whether we may find out if the parents of that shooting suspect will be facing any charges and what those charges could be? Well, Phil, the prosecutor says right now she's reviewing potential charges and she hopes to make an announcement within the next 24 hours, so we should find out tomorrow. Now, as to what those possible charges could be, she repeatedly, when I was pressing her, wouldn't speak specifically about this case because any comments could possibly jeopardize the prosecution. So instead, what I did was I asked more generally, what if, so a separate from this case, a parent had a weapon, their child accessed it and used it to kill or seriously hurt some other people with the parents face charges. And she says all around the country and in Michigan, frequently parents in those circumstances face serious charges, everything from involuntary manslaughter all the way up to second degree murder. Now, there's no guarantee that is the case here, but it's not uh, outside of the realm of possibility, Phil. Understood. Trevor Alt, thank you. Next tonight, a former sheriff's deputy in Columbus, Ohio, has been charged in the killing of Casey Goodson Jr. Authorities say Goodson Jr. was shot six times, five times in the back as he was returning home, his keys still in the door. Here's ABC's Alex Perez. Tonight, murder charges for former sheriff's deputy Jason Mead, who allegedly shot and killed a 23-year-old Casey Goodson Jr. in Columbus one year ago this week. This day could not come soon enough. 
Meade indicted on murder and reckless homicide charges. The former Franklin County, Ohio Sheriff's deputy told investigators he saw a good son who had a license to carry a concealed weapon waving a firearm and then pursued him. Meade says good son was entering the back door of a home with a weapon in hand and allegedly ignored commands to drop it. The family's confusion captured on 911. My grandson just got shot. Who shot him? I don't know. I okay. just heard the gunshots and I would get up and he's laying in the door. Goodson's family says he had no gun in hand and was returning from a dentist appointment with Subway sandwiches for the family. Photos show bullet holes on the screen door, his keys still in the lock, and a bag of food on the floor where he collapsed. Meade's attorney saying that Goodson was pointing the weapon at Meade and that the deputy acted within his lawful duties as an officer. An autopsy revealed Goodson was shot six times, five of those bullets to the back. His heart broke and mother tonight says her fight for justice isn't over. The ultimate fight is the conviction, and I want a life sentence. That's what I'm fighting for. Alex Perez reporting. Next to our ABC News exclusive, George Stephanopoulos one-on-one -on -one with actor Alec Baldwin. Baldwin breaking his silence on that fatal shooting on his movie set, claiming he didn't pull the trigger. A lawyer for the director of photography on that set says he's always said the same thing, that Baldwin didn't shoot. However, some are pushing back on that. Here's ABC's Kaylee Hartung. Tonight, a witness to the shooting on the Russ movie set corroborating Alec Baldwin's claim that he did not pull the trigger of the gun that killed Helena Hutchins. Well, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. So no. you never pulled the trigger? No, 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 no. I, I would never point a gun at anyone and pull a trigger at them, never. Assistant Director Dave Hall's attorney telling me he was just a few feet from Baldwin when the gun went off. Until Alec said that, it was just really hard to believe, but Dave has told me since the very first day I met him that Alec did not pull that trigger. Baldwin recalling that tragic day in October during an exclusive interview with George Stephanopoulos. You said you're not a victim, but uh, is this the worst thing that's ever happened to you? Yes. Yeah. 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 Because I, I, I think back and I think of what could I have done. Baldwin also saying he had no reason to suspect the gun contained a live round. But tonight, new questions. How could a gun just go off? Veteran armor and prop master Dutch Merrick saying accidental discharges for the Colt 45 revolver used are rare but possible. If it's not functioning properly, perhaps the internal mechanism can be jarred to drop the hammer. Um, it's a pretty rare circumstance. That gun is designed not to fire without the trigger being pulled. And as the investigation tries to determine how live rounds wound up on the movie set, authorities searching this prop arsenal. According to the search warrant, PDQ Arm and Prop was one of the vendors supplying Rust with blanks and dummy rounds. Owner Seth Kenny did not want his face on camera. It's not a possibility that they came from PDQ or from myself personally. There's something very unique about the live rounds that were found on Rust, but we've got to wait for the FBI to do its job. Kaylee, thank you. Millions of packages are set to be delivered all across the country, and it's been estimated that 210 million packages have disappeared from American front porches in just the last year. Think about that number. With holiday buying season in full swing now, some police departments are actually using some creative approaches to catch the culprits. ABC's Kana Whitworth has details. Thanks to smart doorbells, hundreds of porch pirates are caught on camera every year. Like this one, swiping a package on his way out of an apartment complex. This thief taking a glance at a package and walking away, only to return and take it later. And this woman stealing from five homes on a single street in California. If you think about package theft, it's kind of a low level crime. It's very easy to do and really the risks are quite low as well. Cameras like these are meant to deter criminals and now police can do more than just see them. They can actually track them down. Police departments across the country are taking aggressive action to ward off package thieves like this one near Portland, Oregon, implementing a different strategy, having previously victimized homeowners place a GPS tracker inside a bait package. When it's picked up, the GPS tracker alerts deputies in the area that the package has been moved. They make sure it's actually leaving the area. And then once they know it's an active theft, they respond. Detective Altier says since they started the new initiative, 
porch piracy has gone down by about 10%. What it is is trying to make a positive effect in the neighborhoods and helping the residents get the things they order. We don't want someone to be without medication because someone decides to steal a package. Experts say changes in people's routines during the pandemic have left many porches open to package thieves for longer. It is very important that we remember to get the package if we're notified, especially um, as soon as we can and not to let it lay there any longer than it needs to be whether we're working from home or whether we get home from work and then retrieve our packages. Kaylee Hartung, thank you. Now let's take a quick turn to something a little sweeter in what could be the future of travel. The first ever passenger plane powered by fuel made of sugar water and corn. And ABC's Gio Benitez took a ride, filed this report. We're boarding a packed flight unlike any other. And you can see right here, this is quite literally an experiment. Inside this engine, United Airlines is using groundbreaking new fuel made from sugar water and corn. We take off, and it's just like any other flight. United CEO Scott Kirby says that's the point. What's that like for you personally? Because here we are, we are in the air right now yeah. with one of the engines with sustainable fuel. Yeah, it's a really proud moment to me to represent the people of United Airlines as, as leading in the global fight against climate change. To find out how, we go inside the Madison, Wisconsin lab that's making this happen. It's called Virant. We take the carbon from the sugar, we rearrange that using a catalytic process, and we create the same materials that you would get from a traditional petroleum refining process. And the end product smells like gas, looks like gas. Smells like gas, looks like gas, burns like gas. In fact, Virant says nothing needs to change on the plane or even a car. The fuel drops right in, but burns 35 to 70% cleaner than regular fuel. And it's made from all kinds of sugars. Corn syrup is the most readily available source to get the technology deployed today, uh, but long term we see things like woody biomass, corn stover, non edible parts to be the, really the true uh, holy grail of, of renewable fuels. Amazing, Geo, thank you. And still to come tonight, the accidental text that led to a conversation with a future Hall of Famer that one group of students will absolutely never forget. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. We have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family himself in jeopardy for us. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. This is what being live is Bring all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. 
You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. We're tracking several headlines around the world at this hour, too. First, thousands of Haitian migrants in Tapachula, Mexico, are pleading to be allowed to travel freely throughout that country and seek employment. A stadium in the southern Mexico area, uh, a city there, has been turned into a makeshift migration processing center. Last week, Mexican officials began moving hundreds of migrants to other states after long waits for asylum and visa requests there, aiming to head off migrant caravans headed north to the U.S. border but thousands remain in limbo. In Asia, heavy rains in central Vietnam have led to floods and landslides. 18 people are missing, with some feared dead. The rain has stopped, and now they are just trying to find the missing. Vietnam is prone to storms and flooding due to its long coastline natural disasters, mostly floods and landslides from storms, killed 378 people last year alone. Turning now to Germany, Chancellor Angela Merkel honored by the military there with their highest ceremony for a civilian, but it's her unique choice of music that has people talking. Her choices, a hymn, a hit song by an East German punk rocker, how cool is that, as well as a song from the 60s called Red Roses Are to Rain for Me. Merkel was born in the 50s to a Protestant pastor and grew up in communist East Germany before becoming the leader of a predominantly male political party in West Germany. Now we turn to a very unlikely porch pirate, this time caught on camera in Connecticut, stealing their way into the night. This unique poacher has ditched the trash cans and is headed for those special deliveries sitting at your front door. ABC's Will Gans has the details on this particular bandit. These days, the Grinch isn't the only one trying to steal Christmas. Don't check out, you're not supposed to take things that don't belong to you. Thanks to smart doorbells, hundreds of porch pirates are caught on camera every year. Like this one swiping a package on his way out of an apartment complex. Or this woman stealing from five homes on a single street in California. But Betsy Lockhart is dealing with a porch pirate unlike any we've ever seen. Despite taking precautions to ward off any would-be thieves in her Fairfield, Connecticut neighborhood. We kind of placed the camera so we would know when we got packages, specifically for the holidays. The camera's no match for this pilfering possum. He just grabbed it, went off to the side over here, and then it was hear him chomping. Then he ran off somewhere with it. The marsupial manhandling the bag, no problem. He traveled with, with the package, and the package was about as big as him. So what was inside that Amazon package that would lead a possum to larceny? Food, maybe? I got some white gold chunky hoops from... Uh, Ross Simon's store on Amazon as a Black Friday deal. And I was looking forward to him. This is my first pair of hoop earrings that I've ever owned. That's right. This possum has a penchant for the finer things. Betsy and her husband looking around with a flashlight for a while, even sending wanted signs to friends and neighbors. The pesky possum apparently scoping out the location the night before and returning the night after the theft. As far as Betsy's refund from Amazon... She's not too worried about it. They were $90 earrings. The fun of it. I, I know that, you know, my, my friends have just had a blast with it. So the entertainment value is probably worth the $90. But wouldn't mind the replacement pair of earrings, so. The video, you can't make this stuff up. Will, thank you. And finally tonight, a group of high school basketball players thought they were texting one of their teammates, but because of a wrong number, ended up actually texting a member of the Super Bowl champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Instead, leading to a FaceTime call they will never forget. Gina Trotman of our Detroit affiliate WXYZ has their story. Can you guys believe it? Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? It's insane. So this is the Notre Dame Prep freshman boys basketball team. Their coach instructed them to make a team iMessage group chat. Vinny, he added uh, who he thought was Luca. It wasn't Luca though. The number was off by one single digit. It was Sean Murphy Bunting cornerback and Super Bowl champion for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He said like he's from Michigan and stuff and he sent the picture like in the locker room 
And then we were like, hold up, this guy actually might be this guy actually might be for real. Sean Murphy Bunting has a local number because he's from Macomb. He graduated from Chippewa Valley High School. Mark here actually told Sean at the very beginning to leave the yeah. group chat. <laughs> no one expects to add an NFL player to a group chat. Like <laughs> one in a billion chance. It gets better though. Sean Murphy Bunting then FaceTimes the entire team group chat. I just remember seeing Sean Murphy himself, like with holding the camera. And then like I saw like the whole locker room in the background. It was like bigger than like, I, I didn't think like the locker rooms were that big. Sitting right next to him was uh, Fournette. And after that, Fournette just took over. And then he showed us everyone from there. <laughs> On the FaceTime call, Leonard Fournette introduced the guys to Rob Gronkowski, Mike Evans, Richard Sherman, some of the biggest names in football. But there was one Buccaneer they really wanted to see. I don't blame whoever did this, but who was the one who stepped up and asked to see the goat? Me, Kevin. Yeah, <laughs> that was kind yeah. of the first I thing I said. I think it was like everyone. Tom Brady jumps on the chat. We all kind of went like crazy. I was like telling like my dad and like my mom like Ma Brady's on the phone. Brady's on the phone. Brady's on the phone. They were like, "Oh, stop lying, stop lying." <laughs> when he said, "What's up?" I didn't not even like I don't even think half of us heard him because we were just like all freaking out. An unbelievable act of kindness done by the Super Bowl champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Their message to the Bucks is simple. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And they now have fans for life over in Michigan. Are you Tampa Bay fans now? Yes. Oh, we, we all are. We all. Sean Murphy. Sean Murphy. <laughs> Bucks fans for life. What a great story. That's our show for tonight. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks so much for streaming with us. It's an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed